Okay, good morning everyone. Um, let's quickly just recap what we looked at last week. We introduced some terminology and we're going to look at that again. But just to go back right, right actually this is prior to last week, the standard form. We've seen this now for some time. Just to emphasize that the software will move the problem that we're considering into standard form where it's a minimization problem subject to a linear objective function. So C transpose X is a linear equation in terms of coefficient C. Linear constraints AX equals B and non-negativity inequalities on X. And we introduced uh, the idea last class that we we're going to investigate changes in these coefficients. Particularly last class we were looking at changes in B coefficients b. Um, in today's class we're going to investigate changes in coefficients c and a as well and then that will complete the topic of sensitivity analysis. But just to um, put it, put the other terminology we learned about last time, we, we said that inside this ax equals b here, um, remember there's slack variables, but if we looked inside there, there's a number of constraints. There's constraints of the form less than or equal to bi and we learned a new term for those last time. We said this is a supply constraint and we learned that if it's expressed as a greater than or equal inequality that's a demand constraint, a minimum demand that you have to meet. Okay so this idea of a supply and a demand falls naturally inside our objective function. Um, the real important thing I want to stress here is that the software will put the problem in this minimization form. We will always work with our problems either in minimization or in maximization form, whichever is appropriate for your case. The software behind the scenes will convert it and then return the results back to you. So if, if your problem is naturally a maximization problem, don't go change it to a minimization problem. Just leave it as a max. The software will take care of the stuff behind the scenes and then unconvert it back for you at the end. Okay? So similarly, remember standard form requires these coefficients in B to be positive. The idea of interpreting them as supplies or demands makes sense when they're positive coefficients and that's um, why we do that as well. Okay, so let me just uh, quickly recap then where we were last class. We were investigating this idea of sensitivity in the coefficient b. And we said that if we were looking at that, and we, we considered, um, for example, let's maybe put it back up here. We were looking at this problem. This is in, this, in the notes from last class. Um, we were looking at the soldering constraint, and the soldering constraint is 10x1 plus 12x2, and there was a supply constraint here, because we've got a minimum number of minutes that we can supply at this station of 1,000 minutes. Okay, so we expressed that as a supply constraint, and we were looking last class at what does it mean if this varies up, right? So we said and showed that the interpretation of changing that value of a thousand can either decrease or it can increase. If it decreases, it moves down here to the red line, was as far as we could go without a change of basis. And you'll recall that we could move it up as far as the blue line without a change of basis. You can certainly change out further still, right? We went as far as went going from a thousand minutes down to 750 minutes. You can certainly decrease it even further, but then your whole problem changes. In particular, what will happen is that this constraint will then become active. So anything between moving it from the red line to the black line maintains the same set of active constraints. That's an important insight from last class. Similar in the increase case, we could increase it from 1,000 to at most 1,068 minutes. Once we go beyond that point, a different set of constraints becomes active and we would have to resolve the problem. But anywhere between the blue and the red line, we can solve and interpret the problem without um, uh, re resolving the GANS problem. Okay? So that was the interpretation then of those coefficients last time. And we ended off the class by also answering 
the important question of the effect of the change in that variable, or that sort of that supply constraint of a thousand minutes, what is the effect of changing it on the objective function? So if we supply more time at that station, we now supply instead of a thousand minutes, we decide to supply and go to a thousand one hundred minutes. We've given more time to that station that well, maybe let me not go that far, uh, because we can only go to 1,068. So maybe let's just go to 1,050 units. Okay, so we're going to increase this black line to just below the blue line. What's going to happen is my optimum is currently at point 2. As that black line shifts closer and closer to the blue line, my optimum slides along this small diagonal piece here that connects point 2 and point 5. So as my optimum slides along there, the same set of constraints are still active. The number of units of x1 that I produce goes higher. The number of units of x2 that I should produce goes lower. And my objective function therefore increases. Okay, so that's the interpretation of that. But how much does my objective function increase per units change? is what the marginal values give us. And we ended off the class with a discussion there on marginal values. And we'll see this again in today's class. So let's go to the handout for today, which recaps some of that. So the handout for today we're starting, and I'm, I'll, I'll go back to the soldering constraint. So we only have 1,000 minutes at that station. If we increase the 1,000, we introduce the word or the terminology that we're relaxing. So if you go from 1,000 to 1,050, you're relaxing the feasible region. You're opening it up. If you do the opposite, if you decrease that, you, you're doing what is called tightening up the feasible region. And we learned last class that relaxing a feasible region will increase the objective function or it will stay the same. Okay. So relaxing will always improve the objective function or it will stay the same. Let me just give you an example of a case where relaxing the constraint leaves the objective function the same. So if we go back to this uh, diagram here from last class, Unfortunately, I just have to flip back here. Right, so here if I increase the soldering constraints of 1,000 and I go to 1,050, we see here that the objective function is increasing. What is an example of a case where the objective function stays the same? If we look prior at this placement constraint, is an example of that. Here the placement constraint is in black. And I can shift it even further, and nothing changes to the objective function. Right? I can take the placement constraint and take it to 1,500 and take it even further still. Nothing changes because my optimum is over there. So shifting this higher leaves the objective function unchanged. I've opened up. I've made my feasible region larger. Right? Because when I move this line up, this feasible region over here gets bigger. So feasible region has increased but the objective function has not changed. Okay, so key, key point then is relaxing leads to an improvement in the objective, or at the very worst, it just stays the same. Nothing's changed. Everyone clear on that interpretation? OK, so that's, uh, that seems to be easy. Then let's uh, move on from that. Um, I just wanted to point out how you know whether a constraint is active or inactive based on your GAMS output. The GAMS output will show an active constraint will be one that has a marginal value. Constraints that are inactive have a zero marginal value. Okay. So for example, we could tell from this output that the slack variable for placement is zero or non-zero. The slack variable for the placement constraint is 0 or non-zero? Is non-zero. Inactive constraints have non-zero slacks. 
Conversely, the, ac the slack variable for the soldering constraint must be zero because it's active. So active constraint, it's got a non-zero marginal value, so it will have a zero slack. So marginals and slacks always seem opposite each other. Okay. And the interpretation we can take from this idea of adjusting this coefficient here on the right-hand side. I'll just move to this board so people on the other side of the class can see. If I look at my objective function and I give it a lowercase letter p equals c transpose x, p meaning profit, most often uh, that is what our objective function is. Okay, and then let's say I've got something here like 10x1 plus 12x2 is less than or equal to some bi. The idea of a marginal value is exactly just saying what is the change in profit per unit change in bi. So dp, db, or delta p over delta b is the interpretation of a marginal value. So the marginal value last class for the soldering constraint was 0.625. It says a one unit increase in that resource, okay, so a one unit increase in B, increase B by one unit, what is the corresponding change or improvement in the profit? Another way that you can interpret that is let's say, let's take this uh, constraint. It's currently set at 10x1 plus 12x2 is less than 1,000. What I could do is change that 1,000 to 1,001 and resolve my linear programming problem. P will go from some value to some higher value. It's got to go higher because this is an active constraint that is being relaxed. So P will increase. So delta P will be positive. Delta B here I've changed by one unit. And so then my marginal value can be interpreted as a one unit change on the right hand side and you just simply resolve the resolve the problem okay now I can keep going I can go from a thousand to a thousand one to a thousand and two three four and keep changing and every single one unit that I go up in this example I'm going to get a plus 0 0.625 increase in P and then again another 0.625 increase in P and so on the opposite is also true, of course, right? If I go the other way, let's say I go from 1,000 to 999, I'm going to get a 0.625 decrease in my profit, right? So tightening, I'm tightening now going up this way. My profit drops. If I go this way, I'm relaxing. So it's, it's a, a linear change in the, rate, in the neighborhood around your optimum. Okay. And then, of course, the natural question that you can ask is, well, how far can you go? And we looked at that last class, and we established these ranges. And the, r these ranges are given to you in the GAMS output. So GAMS uh, does the essentially what GAMS is doing is shifting those constraints for you and seeing how far can you push them before another set of variables become active and it tells you what that range is. In this case I can vary b i that 1000 it's nominally at 1000 but I can go as low as 750 and I can go as high as 1068. Going any further your constraints will change to a different set of active constraints. Okay. So as long as you stay within those bounds you can you can confidently say that your objective function will increase by 0.625 for a one unit increase between those bounds. If we're looking at the inspection constraint, it's currently at 500, but it can go as low as 434 and as high as 666. And every one unit change there will lead to a 0.937 improvement in profit. Okay, so that's, this is by, f by far for me the most important part of this course, is being able to read the linear programming output from GANS. I don't really care that we understand what the simplex method is doing. We're not going to be coding it up, but I want you to have a geometric picture of it in your mind, as well as the ability to interpret these outputs. And that's what we've just done here in the past 20 minutes. Okay. So let's, um, 
let's move on then from that and try to understand now not only changes in B, but the changes in the matrix A. Okay, so back to standard form. Um, so subject to AX equals B and non-negativity, we've, we've now looked at changes in B. And we're comfortable, or should be comfortable interpreting that. What about changes in matrix coefficients in A? Okay, so back to the soldering constraint. So I'm going to keep looking at this one just because it's a one that we've got a good picture in our minds for. So 10x1 plus 12x2 less than or equal to 1,000. So what I'm referring to in this ex uh, case now is what happens if we go vary that value of 12? Or what happens if we go vary that value of 10? And the nice result from this, we don't, I, I can show you a geometric picture in a, in a, on the next page, but the bottom line from all of those changes is that it actually works in the same way as changing B somewhat, in the sense that for supply constraints, <coughs> constraints that are exp expressed with a less than or equal to, increasing a coefficient can be seen as tightening, and decreasing that coefficient can be seen as relaxing. So if I take that 10 and I head this way, if I go down to 9s and 8s and so on, I'm relaxing. And this way, I'm seen as tightening. But only because this is a less than or equal to constraint. OK, the interpretation flips around if I had a demand constraint. So just uh, either write down that table or remember the table for one case, and then the other case is the mirror image of it. Okay, so yes, and yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So like going ten, nine, eight, seven. I was, I'm thinking along a, a vertical number line. Sorry. Yeah, maybe. And then going here, 10, 11, 12 would be tightening. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe my mind thinks a little bit differently sometimes. OK, so going up in this number line, um, or in other words, decreasing the coefficient there is seen as relaxing. Right? It, it makes intuitive sense, right? Because you're saying it takes 10 minutes for circuit board x1 and 12 minutes for circuit board x2 to be um, sorted. So relaxing is it now takes less time to solder that circuit board. You're giving more room to use that soldering constraint. If you're using up more of your resource here, in other words, it takes 11, 12, 13, or more minutes to solder each circuit board, you really are tightening your degree of feasibility. So the intuitive interpretation of these things makes sense in, in all cases. Let me, um, everyone clear on this just as a tabular. Oh, sorry, Chris, I didn't get your question. What if one group should increase and one decrease? We're going to look at multiple uh, changes next. We're still looking at one at a time. That's important, yeah. We're only looking at one thing varying. OK, so let's look at the effect of this coefficient 12 now. So going from 12 to 14 minutes then has the effect of uh, tightening and therefore, my objective function must decrease. We know that tightening leads to a decrease, or at least it will stay the same. But let's try to see this visually. And that's here for us on the next page. I've tried to illustrate it as follows. So what I've gone and done here is I've looked at 10x1 plus 12x2 is my base case. And now I'm comparing it to 10x1 plus 14x2 is less than 1,000. What you can see from this just mathematically is by changing that 12 to a 14 is I've changed the slope of the system. Right? So that line tilts, the red line, um, you might not see it up 
here, but you can see how it's, it's coming together over here. The soldering line has now tilted from the base case here in black down to there in red. And in doing so, it has decreased the feasible region, right? I've, we've gone and increased the coefficients. We know from the table that must lead to tightening. Tightening means our feasible region becomes smaller. Our objective function decreases. Okay, so my objective function now will drop by tightening up that constraint. Okay. So my optimum is going to then move, as that line tightens, my optimum is going to move to this point over here. But it's definitely, if you look at these objective co contours going there, my objective function was originally over here. It's moved down there, so objective function is dropped. That confirms geometrically what we know from the textbook. So don't just believe the textbook's tables. Let's uh, interpret them geometrically. I, I really hope um, that you get a good geometric or visual interpretation of linear programming problems. Um, not because that we're going to interpret our results from GAMS in that way, but the next sections of the course build on a good geometric understanding of the space that we're dealing in. Um, so that's, that's what I'm trying to build up now as well as we go through. Any questions on that? Okay, straightforward stuff so far. There's a summary there for you. The only thing that's new here really is this last bullet point, which is also an obvious statement. It says tightening too much will eventually lead to a space where there's no feasible solution. You can conceivably shift constraints around and tighten them so much so right, you can bring these constraints in and tighten from the left and the right and you can eventually have no feasible region. It's very easy to set up a linear programming problem where there's no solution, where there's no valid combinations of your search variables that leads to a, a valid answer. Mathematically that indicates that there's no values of x that will satisfy the inequality constraints. At least one or more of your inequality constraints will be violated, and you can't possibly find any x's that leads to a value of x, uh, any values of x's that leads to a satisfied feasible region. Okay. So that's really hard to, to figure out geometrically. But again, computer software is really great at doing this for us, and we will well, you did see, at least in the first tutorial, you might recall, you set up a, a LP that had no feasible region. You set up LPs that were unbounded. You, you've set up LPs then that had no feasible region. So uh, it is possible to do that by excessive tightening. The next um, important point we want to investigate is sensitivity in the objective function. So this is the last sensitivity we're going to look at is coefficients there in C. In this particular optimization problem we're dealing with with the soldering and I really hope today is the last class we have to use this as an example. Um, our objective function was equal to 10x1 plus 15x2. So in other words, what I'm investigating here is what happens if there's some uncertainty in those two numbers? And let's just quickly recall it says that we make 10 units of profit for board A. And board A, remember, we denoted by x1. And the 15 similarly denotes $15 of profit per board <coughs> B. Okay. So these coefficients are uncertain. There's no way that a company knows those profit values for sure. Anytime one of their, in, their incomes or, or their costs change. So classic example where companies use this is you're currently selling this board B maybe for $200. Your costs then to make it are $185, so your profit is 15. Okay, that's how we got that $15. Let's say the company is now deciding to bump up the price to 205 So now the profit is 20 instead of 15 
let's assume that they can still sell all those board Bs at the, at the higher price. They're now making $20 per board instead of the original 15. The current optimal solution, um, you might not uh, remember this from the prior class, but I'll just note it here because we're going to use it. The current optimal solution says to make 62.5 boards of A, and the current optimal says to make 31.25 of B. The question now, of course, becomes, should we still keep going with those production volumes? Or should we be making more boards of type B and we'll get a higher profit? Right? So we're trying to answer that question. And this is one way that that question comes up. Another way that the question obviously comes up is, let's go back to our sales price of $200 and our profit of 15. Another way that that 15 might change is we might be able to um, reduce the cost of the production. So it's currently costing 185, we're down to 15. Or more commonly is that cost goes up. Right? You have to play, pay employees a bit more, minimum wage might go up, or uh, whatever benefits you're offering your employees goes up, and so now it costs you more to produce that board, and now instead of making 15, you're down to 10. Should you still be making the same ratio of A and B? So there, this, this by far happens more commonly than any of the other changes. So let's try to investigate this geometrically and then we'll see in GAMS how we get the same answer. So this one I recognize of course is not in color in your notes, but I've used uh, different dashed lines to help you. Let's see here the, the visual picture. And what I'm investigating is only the coefficient of 10. So 10x1 plus 15x2, I'm focusing on the 10. Right, the interpretation for the 15 is, is exactly the same. So base case, 10x1 plus 15x2 is the red line. This red line here is exactly parallel to all the, all the objective function contours that I have there earlier. So that's my classic objective function, 10x1, 15x2, and that red line in particular is the base case at the optimum. Now, if I decrease that coefficient of 10 to 7.5, the line tilts is shown to the blue, and if I increase it, it goes up. And so you, essentially it's, it's, it's pivoting on that point. And I've indicated that we can pivot it only as far as from the red down to the blue. I can't go any further geometrically, and I can't go any more than the green before the green starts to touch that line. Any thoughts why that's the extent to which I can only consider changes in the coefficients? Maybe take a minute to, to look at the diagram a bit more carefully, discuss it with the person next to you. Why can't I go further than the blue and the green extents shown? Just take, yeah. This is the objective function. We're only changing this 10 in it. Why can't I go further than, than that? Okay, any suggestions why, why I'm saying that that's the extent to which we can consider changes in coefficient 10? Yeah? Um, I 
think uh, you're gonna be you're gonna start violating like other constraints that are placed here. Like for example, from the previous example, like uh, the solder and placement constraints were there. Okay, so you're gonna start widening other constraints. Or violating other. Constraints. Or violating other constraints. Yeah, that's that's definitely part of the answer for sure. The implicit assumption is that up to that point, you're not violating any of the other constraints. If we go further, we start to violate that, yeah? Does it have to do with like, being lined up with the constraints? Like, with, depending on which side, like, if it keeps rotating, then once it's lined up with the constraint, like any point along that constraint can be you know, used as a point, but then once you change it, it doesn't affect it as much? Or OK, so there's definitely the, the idea of it doesn't affect it up to that point. What, so let's maybe take the blue line as example. What happens if I go beyond the blue? Right, so we can absolutely do that. 10, I, I've said, goes down to 7.5. But what happens if it does go down to 6? What if I really am only making $6 a profit on circuit board A? So in other words, that blue line is now something more like this. What's happened to the geometric space? So, The, sorry, the feasible region was originally where that blue line, that dashed blue line was. Okay, so if you were to go down, right, you yeah. would, like the below the pivot point, yeah. you would be violating the feasible region. Would I? No, like, you know how the pivot point is 2, right? Yeah. So if you were to keep going. So it's, it's tilting on that point. Yes. Yeah. So then at the bottom, like the blue line at the bottom would now be on the top. So it wouldn't be in the feasible region. The, yeah, so the feasible region ends there. So if anything, you've just... So no, the feasible region is, is given by that line and there. So the feasible region is still there. This has no this side has no effect on the feasible region. Yeah. No, no. That's but good. Good that you pointed out, uh, Tyler. No. Okay. Oh, I was going to say, wouldn't that constraint become active? That's right. If you go further than this point, this this point now becomes your active constraint, and your optimum shifts to that location. So. The key why we can vary between the red line between blue and green is that anywhere in that range, that still stays your optimum. So what this says is here, I can take this coefficient of 10. It can go as low as 7.5x1, or it can go as high as 12.5x1. My optimum is exactly in the same location. I still produce that much of board A and that much of board B. And that's really interesting because it, it says a company that's trying to, because this is, this is what happens here in, in companies, their thinking is that, OK, let's, their current cost to produce this product is $185. Someone goes and says, well, I can make changes and bring this down to Instead of 180, I can take it down to 175. Okay, so it was 180, 185. Sorry, let's put some actual numbers here. It was 185, and I'm now taking it down to 180. So they've reduced it by five. Their immediate thinking is that they should go and make more of that product because they now have got a greater profit margin on it. But the result from this shows is that that's not always the case. If you're only changing your objective function, you're still within that range. You should still go make exactly the same amount as you did before. You shouldn't necessarily go try and boost production. Okay? So where it comes from is that it says that your optimum remains at that point 2 until another set of constraints becomes active. And that's what happens when the red line touches the blue comes down to as far as the blue. If I go any further than that point, constraint shift to become active at that location. And then two no longer is my optimum anymore. Similarly, for the green line, I can take the red line up. And if I keep going too far, eventually that location there at three will become my new optimum. And you, you basically then have to resolve the problem. So let's, let's take a look at this in the GAMS output where we can see this. And then there's a problem as well for us to, to try and understand it a bit more carefully.
GAMS will tell us in the output, there's a section called variable name. And here it will show you that your current coefficient value is 10. And you can take it up and down to 7.5 and, and as high as 12.5. The coefficient 15 can also shift. Coefficient 15, it, this output from GAMS indicates to us that we can go as low as 12 in this case and we can go as high as 20. As long as your profit per board is within those ranges, this is still your optimal solution. If your profit coefficients go outside that range, you have to resolve. OK, so take a look at and try answering this question then just below the table. I'll give you a minute to read it and answer it. Also discuss it with the person next to you to make sure that you've both got the correct understanding here. Right, the lines are when the coefficient, it's yeah. 10x1 plus 15x2. Yeah. When it's changed, decrease the 10 down to 7.5. Yeah, but what does that, what is that, that difference? Oh, it becomes, it's the objective function. Right, so the objective function is currently like that. Oh, okay, I see. All it's right, changed thanks. the slope of the objective yeah. function, yeah. They represent the coefficients in the objective function, in this case profit, per unit board. Okay, so does, let's answer this question. The cost of goods is reduced, so that's a cost. Your cost of goods, COGS, as it's commonly called in supply chain and logistics, COGS goes down, you get $4 increase in profits. $4 increase in profit then indicates that instead of producing um, boards, sorry, instead of getting four, $15, you're now up to 19 19 is within the range from 12 to 20. So we can go and use this output from, from GAMS. Let's be clear here, there's a bit of confusion for, from one or two of you. This table here refers to the coefficients in the objective function, 10x1 plus 15x2. X1 was for board A, X, t X for board B was X2. Okay, so the 10 and 15 there refer to our base case and then in each row, we can read the minimum and maximum values which we can take them down and across up to. Okay, so because $19 is within the range, we can still say with confidence the optimum is at the current location. Optimum has not shifted. And so what will this op optimum profit be? Well, the optimum profit will be 10 times 62.5 plus 19 now times 31.25. So by decreasing your cost of goods, your profit definitely goes up. That's a given, right? It must go up. You've made your good cheaper to make, so you, you make more profit. 
In this case, you're making um, that much profit. And so you can sub in the numbers here. You get 1218.75 dollars of profit. Just to give you some context here, your, your prior optimum was a hundred and oh, sorry, a thousand and ninety three. Okay, but that that prior optimum was still at the same location of x one and x two. X one and x two, the number of boards of A and the number of boards B don't change; they stay in the same location at at location two on the geometric diagram. But your profit does go up, goes up by that amount. But what does not change is you don't go and produce more circuit boards of type B just because you're making more profit on it. And that's the temptation is to say, well, we're making more money on it. Let's produce more of it. Well, that would actually end up being suboptimal. OK, and you can go prove that to yourself geometrically. Sub these, it's very easy. If you're ever stuck in GAMS questioning this output, just go sub in this new value here, rerun GAMS, and you will prove to yourself that you'll still get exactly the same optimum. The optimum has not, not moved. Similarly, I'd like you to go try this problem for yourself. You have the code for it. Go and change that coefficient from, instead of 19, go change it to 21, just beyond the bound of 20. And then you'll see your optimum does change. And that's what assignment uh, 2, tutorial 3, those of you that were in the lab on Friday and those of you that will be in the lab this afternoon, you, you went or you will go do that. You'll go, um, Jaffer and James have set up the assignment in such a way that you go step these values up and down and keep resolving it and you, you can prove this to yourself. Okay. Now let me take the question and just slightly alter it a little bit. And I'd like you to think along these, these lines. Let's say you've solved this GAMS problem, and that is your output that you get. The question I'd like you to try and think about now is to improve your understanding of what's happening at the optimum. Okay, that's a very, it's a different question I'm asking. Improve your understanding of what's going on at the optimum. Should you focus on the variable that has a narrow range, or should you focus on the variable that has a wider range? So, Let's take a look at the first variable. It has a range of five, down two and a half, up two and a half. The second variable has a range of eight, from 12 to 20. Should you go spend time and effort understanding what's happening to the first variable with a smaller range, or should you spend time and effort understanding the variable with a larger range? Uh, I'm not considering at all this coefficient. I'm simply considering the range, the distance. This is a distance of 5. This is a distance of 8. Anyone got some thoughts on this that they're thinking or uncertainties? Yeah. Uh, I would go with the smaller range because um, it affects the optimum much more quickly than the uh, larger range. OK. So for those of you that didn't hear, the thought is to go with the variable that has the smaller range because it affects the optimum much more quickly than the variable with the larger range. Um, well, I, I think it's the, uh, the wider range because with the, the, with the smaller range, um, there, there's not 
Okay, so there's not so much that you can do with variables that change it within the smaller range is what you're, you're saying. Okay, any other suggestions? Joseph? <coughs> Sorry, uh, wouldn't it depend more on the uncertainty you have in your, your, uh, your profits, like in your coefficients? Okay, and that's what exactly what we're considering here. This is the play before you have to change the, 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 how you solve the problem, but it's also the range within which you can consider the, uns the sensitivity or the uncertainty. So I guess in that case, I would consider it to be the smaller region. Like, I would focus on that more. With the that smaller region? Okay, so two votes for the smaller region. Devin? Uh, I was going to agree with the smaller region. Smaller region? Because if you're uncertain, and you only have one plus minus one on one thing, plus minus ten on another. Yeah. Okay, so here's the general, the general advice, and is to focus on variables that, that move within a smaller range. Variables that move within a large range, you're going to have some uncertainty in that range, right? So let's take the larger variable, between 12 and 20. It says the profit varies between 12 and 20 per unit. It's got to change by that large value before your optimum switches to something different. Okay, it can vary as low as 12 and as high as 20, and this will still be the optimum number of boards to produce. A variable with a narrow range has got a very narrow region of play or uncertainty or sensitivity. That's the whole purpose of this section over the past two classes, is to consider uncertainty in our knowledge. Right? So this variable that's got a narrower range of uncertainty, we should go investigate that a little bit more. What do we mean by investigate? Is Let's get a good understanding of what that actual profit number is. Is it really possible to only make seven and a half dollars on it? Right? Get a really good understanding of this because if this variable is uncertain and we're going to quickly hit into one of those bounds, then we want to be clear on where we are, right? We want to go investigate a little bit more carefully on that constraint. That's why it's a sensitivity analysis because we're uncertain. So the rule of the rule or the guidance that we use is narrow ranges are considered and the other important point is that if the current value is very close to either the up the lower or the upper bound. Right? It says that you're very close to that edge where some other set of constraints could become active. You should go investigate a little bit more carefully and try to improve your knowledge there. So that's just uh, some, some general guidance. And now let's um, switch to another problem then. I'll just walk it through with you. And we I won't provide the answer. We'll look at this in, in the next class. But we're switching to a different problem. So you get a bit of experience with something other than circuit boards. So here's a small piece of output. We've modeled the distillation column in GAMS. Now, we know everyone here in the room doesn't expect a distillation column to behave linearly. We know that it behaves non-linearly. But if we take a linearization of the non-linear equations, we can form a linear model of the distillation column. And we can solve that in GANs. And here's two particular equations. There's more equations, but I'm only focusing on two. The equation for the reflux and the equation for the pump flow. The reflux constraint has an upper bound of 600 liters per hour. And the pump has a lower bound and an upper bound. It's got a, d a minimum demand of 1,000 and an upper supply of 2,000. That's the capability of the pump. We can't run it dry, and we can only run it as high as 2,000 liters per hour. Similarly, for reflux flow rate, we can only accommodate as much as 600 liters per hour. So those are my two constraints. Now, the question I'm asking here is to read this output from GAMS and to try and answer this question. What is the effect on profit if we were able to increase the reflux flow by 50 liters per hour? And then next, I'm asking just below that, what is the effect on profit if we decrease the reflux flow 
by 50 liters per hour. Okay. So to answer these questions, you have to understand marginal values. You have to understand which constraints are active, which are not active. And you have to, later on, we'll come to some of this other understanding up here. Okay. So I'm going to leave that question then over the page. It continues on. And you can also answer those two questions. What does that plus infinity mean for the pump flow? And a colleague is proposing to increase the capacity of pump seven. What is your response to that proposal? Okay. So let's, let's be sure we can read and interpret these GAMS outputs and we'll take this up in next class. Please bring this handout with you next time um, so we can continue from it.